Public speaking is, uh, I wouldn't say it's my forte, you didn't see it on the list of interest, so um, bear with me on a few things. Um, so I'm, I'm here to present on secrets of personal medication management while you're at home, while you're traveling, and how to properly dispose of medications. First though, I wanted to prove that I do ride BMX. I can't see it very well, but I'm the circled rider in red looking down terrified because that's pretty much how I feel right now. Every time I get on the gate, I freak myself out because I think of the what ifs and I have to think about the experience. Um, it is a family sport. I don't know if you can see my son. He's in the background. He's got the white plate number four. So sometimes I do race him and that doesn't turn out very well either. Um, so just to go over the, some of the objectives, you know, when I, um, put this together and talked to Linda. I said, what do you want me to talk about? And there was a, a bunch of ideas that came up. And I said, well, I can touch on a little bit of all of them. So here we are today with um, some ideas. And a lot of my ideas come from stories from my personal experience with my family and also with my patients at the customer or at the pharmacy counter. Um, I've had some stories related to traveling too with meds and then of course the number one question we get always at Denali Pharmacy is how do you dispose of meds and then if I have time I have some bonus secrets about um, related to pharmacy and your prescriptions so just a little more background information about me this is the whole reason I went to pharmacy school to Norman 100 milligrams 30 years ago, my mom had a heart attack at a very young age. She was taken to FMH, had awesome care. I think back then, they stayed in ICU for like a week and then two south for like a week and then they came home. It was really an ordeal. And when she came home, she was not the same person. It was pretty terrifying. She was weak. She was almost limp. She was weepy. Usually those are some of the symptoms you see when they're having a heart attack, not afterwards. And so it was really concerning. And about, I think, a day and a half of home, both my dad said, we got to take her back. So we took her back to the hospital. I mean, I even tied her shoes and helped her get into the car. That's how lethargic she was. And it turned out that this was too high of a dose. And I was going to UAF at the time. And I thought, wow, you mean that little white pill, smaller than an aspirin, did this to my mom? Hmm, why did that happen? So I had to look up pharmacy, pharmacy schools, figure out how to go. And it was my major excuse to get out of Alaska. Because um, a homegrown kid, all you know is 40 below, you know there's something better out there. Um, so just a couple of facts about medications, um, why it's important to manage it. Nearly a third of adults in the US ha are on five or more medications. And um, nearly 700,000 emergency visits and 100,000 hospital visits per year are caused by adverse medication events. And I can, you know, my mom was admitted because the dose was too high. Um, I always like to talk about my dad. Um, I'm going to sprinkle a lot of dad stories in this presentation. He was um, a person with many chronic diseases and he didn't always use his medications right so in the you know we say in the community one in five older adults potentially take medications inappropriately that was my dad and his inhalers he had congestive or <coughs> copd chronic obstructive pulmonary disease so he had a rescue inhaler he had an inhaler for a steroid he had another inhaler that helped dry up secretions but he didn't use them right he didn't always use them Sometimes he used them. Sometimes he just whipped out that inhaler and went puff, puff, because he couldn't breathe. And I'd say, as a new pharmacist, Dad, it's the wrong way to use the inhaler. You've got to use a spacer. You've got to take these deep breaths. You've got to wait a minute or two between the puffs. Let them work. No, no, he wasn't going to listen to his daughter. So we ended up with an admission to FMH emergency room one time when he was up visiting. And, um, came down to basically inappropriate use of inhalers. And uh, I, I see a, a fellow ED emergency room nurse who is now retired, um, but Dr. Jeff Bowerick was on the night that we brought my dad in. 
and I took him out in the hall and I said, listen, I love my dad, but he doesn't listen to me. Can you talk to him about his meds? And so a great thing Jeff did, he sat down and he wrote down every inhaler and he said why he uses it, what time he should use it, and why do you use a spacer. My dad became a convert. <laughs> he listened to him, even though I tried for uh, years to say stuff. Um, just some more facts. 81% of older adults use at least one prescription drug. 29% of older um, adults use at least five or more, so that third. Um, and then we get into supplements and over-the-counter. 42% um, use OTC, 49% use supplements. And then when you put that together, they also use it with prescription drugs. So you have some percentages down here that say OTC medications, 46% um, with prescription drugs, 52% with dietary supplements. That leads to one in 25 older adults are at a risk for a major drug-drug interaction. That's why pharmacists are here, right? You gotta use us, you gotta talk to us. You need to tell us more about your medications than just what you're picking up at the counter. You need to tell us what else you're on. That's what helps us understand stuff. I think I'm getting ahead of my notes here. Um, so some other important information. It's a fact. As we get older, we're not the same. I can say that. Um, as you get older, your liver and your kidneys don't work as well. Or they, they work, they just might be at a little lower function than they were 10, 20 years ago. And, that, and that's a concern with medications because sometimes they don't get metabolized correctly, break down correctly, get excreted correctly, can lead to more side effects, the drugs in your body longer. So interesting, I've used this phrase a couple times, it's usually on a tourist because I don't have access to their full medical chart like I do at FMH. Um, I'll say to them when I'm giving out this drug, because I see an age and I see this drug, and they go, has anybody talked to you about your renal function, your kidney function? How, how is that working for you? Has anybody ever said they're concerned? Just because that's a clue to me to know whether I need to be concerned about if that dose is right for that particular drug for you. So um, the other things that can change as you get older is you can gain weight, you can lose weight, Decreased body fluid, increased fatty tissue, it all affects how the, a drug works in the body. So it's just stuff, unfortunately, is a fact of life. The other thing that happens is increased sensitivity to medicines as you get older. <coughs> My favorite example is Benadryl. I could take Benadryl when I was in college and function. I take a Benadryl today, and you might as well call it a day because I'm going to be sleeping all day. Just a little more sensitive to it. And it's the same with the um, older adults. They are more sensitive to medications. They're more prone to drowsiness, dizziness, side effects of drugs. And that leads to the potential of falls. So we want to be really careful with that. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm a list maker because I can't remember from one second to the next second what I'm doing. So impaired memory, also along with impaired, impaired hearing, also along with vision loss can make it more difficult, especially in my dad's case sometimes, to understand and remember instructions, especially as you get into more complicated drug regimens. And unfortunately, there's a lot of chronic conditions. My dad was an example. He was, we say COPD, CHF. He loved to say that he wasn't, how did he say it? Um, he was pre-diabetic and dad, I said, dad, no, you're a person with diabetes. You gotta watch your blood sugar. So um, that added to it. And then, you know, when you have these chronic conditions, you also sometimes go to multiple prescribers. You have sometimes a kidney doctor. You have a cardiologist. You have your internal medicine. And so they can all be writing prescriptions and not necessarily knowing what the other one's going on. So those are things that are a big concern when we're looking at prescription drugs. So also that may cause some issues or make uh, pat patients have a hard time following drug regimens is the affordability. This is usually like the number one question that gets me to the counter at Denali Pharmacy. I can't afford my medications. 
and what can you do, or there's a big deductible. And so I have some ideas for that. Um, but really affordability, we hope, isn't one of those roadblocks that stops people from medications. Forgetfulness. I actually had a, I bowl too, but um, I had a bowling person stop by the pharmacy counter last night. I'm helping to take care of somebody. This person just cannot remember to take their meds. Do you have ideas? And I said, there's a whole slew of ideas. Kind of listed them. Um, bothersome side effects. That might be a reason why they don't take the meds. So I looked at this guy and I go, is this offensive or not? And I'm like, no, that's my grandpa. It also could be my dad. Um, unfortunately, they get, um, they, like my grandpa, he was diagnosed with lymphoma at 78 and he started treatment. And unfortunately, that made him immune compromised. So then he developed shingles. Shingles is horribly painful. It's just really uncomfortable. And they prescribed him Tylenol number no. three with codeine. But nobody ever told him that it causes, codeine causes constipation. So here he was dealing with lymphoma and the treatment and the pain of shingles. And now he had this other major concern and he was of the generation where he didn't talk about it. So it was a really tough thing to see your grandpa sit there all close to tears over the fact that this was the situation of these side effects. So it, it was really concerning. Um, there's also sometimes a perception that the medication doesn't work. Can't exactly tell you the words that my dad would string in front of medications where he would think, this is not working for me. I'm tired of this. It also led to what I think looks like stubbornness or just plain the feeling loss of control, you know. They, they have all these things. They don't feel like they used to. Now they gotta try to understand their medications and be correct about it. Um, uh, I can, just numerous stories about my dad, but one of them is Lasix. That was something he could control. He, cause Lasix, this frosamide, aka water pill, gets, rest, gets rid of the excess fluid. And on certain days when he did errands, he didn't want to take it because he didn't want to have to stop and find a public restroom every five minutes. And one of the times, he, my mom and he were really busy, and it was over a couple days, probably getting ready for visitors. And he didn't take it for three days. He had such a fluid buildup, he ended up in the emergency room. The kicker to that one story, though, is that my mom didn't know he wasn't taking his Lasix. So when the EMTs came to get him, and they asked him what list of meds he was on, he, my mom couldn't tell him. So that led to a whole bunch of other things in that visit. So remember that story. So going on to how do you manage your medication? Like I say, most of these stories come from my dad. A lot of them come from people at the counter, and I will change names to protect the innocent. <clears throat> but a lot of them start with just general questions at the counter that brings a pharmacist up. I just had a fellow employee of the hospital came up, and the first question was about affordability and the copay question and how it was on insulin. How can, how can this cost so much for my mom? And so I tried to help her with some ways of getting that taken care of. But then, um, then it came down to is my mom can't inject herself with the insulin. She's too scared. So my dad does it. Well, my dad just had a stroke and he has a tremor and now he's lost some function and he can't inject her. And so they're staying with her. And so then we were trouble trying to figure out some other ways to help them out. So the, these stories happen all the time. So I, I just give them examples because my reoccurring theme to you is you got to use your pharmacy or your pharmacist to help you on some things. But I'll still give you a few ideas. So your number one thing should be use one pharmacy, period. <laughs> I actually had a meeting with the nurses in the Porter Heart Center today, 
and I was discussing how outpatient pharmacy might be able to help them with some ideas, uh, with some issues that we were having with patients not getting their meds and some other um, patient assistance ideas. And they said, you know, when they go to get a complete list of their patients' medications, it's hard to do it when they use multiple pharmacy. Um, nurses and even pharmacists, when patients get admitted to the hospital, spend quite a bit of time to get a medication list together so we know exactly what you're on so we can figure out if those are the issues or so you don't miss a med while you're admitted to the hospital. This next one, synchronization of medications, is one of the new buzzwords of pharmacy. And I have to say that Denali Pharmacy is just starting to do this. It's trying to synchronize all your medications to one fill date. So you go to the pharmacy one time, pick up all your meds, and don't forget one. And so it's really quite uh, a good service. I mean, not that we don't mind seeing you three times a month, but I'm sure you don't want to drive in and get out of your car three times a month and come see me. Um, reading all the drug information that we send home with you, because when we go to counsel you, we can sound like a terrible drug commercial. I mean, we try to hit the highlights and we try to tell you the important things about medications. We try to tell you how to take them, how to, how, what to take them with, if it's okay with food or not. We try to tell you all the side effects, but sometimes we miss stuff. And so we say, just kind of look over that drug information. I've had patients call me hours after they go home, sometimes days, and say, hey, I was reading this, and I noticed. <laughs> and a lot of times, it's a very valid point. And so um, I would just highly recommend it. I also recommend, this is a difficult thing, because pharmacists don't get paid for their time to spend with you. We get paid to dispense drugs. But we want to talk to you. We want to make sure you understand your medication. But when things are happening at a pharmacy, and especially at Denali Pharmacy, when you're getting discharged from the hospital, you don't want to stand there and listen to me. Because you've already listened to the nurse, and you've listened to the doctor, and you think you've got everything, and you just want to go home. And I don't blame you. When I've been in the hospital, I just want to go home too. But I always stress to people, it's OK not to talk to me now, but when you get home and you're looking over your meds, go ahead and call up the pharmacy. If they, they can't talk to you right then, they might get your name and number and call you back. But do take part with your pharmacist and the drug information they're trying to give you. So the other thing is, oh. Just, uh, put that last slide in terms of, you know, you're talking about one pharmacy uh, getting discharged from the hospital it might be for a town, it might be Anchorage or Seattle. Uh, that coordination between the pharmacy that you've dealt with in the hospital, maybe going home for an initial, and your regular pharmacy. How do, you How do you communicate that? How do you communicate what you got at the hospital pharmacy on discharge or maybe when you're sent out of state? It's a, it's a difficult thing. Um, one thing is that you should end up with a list of medications when you get discharged from the hospital. So it should be a clear list of what you're on. You're, hopefully your physician has been notified of that list. Um, if your prescription was written at that pharmacy and has refills, they can be transferred to your regular pharmacy and then filled there. That's one way. Um, there are hopes and dreams that software gets a little more intelligent, um, or sophisticated is the word I should probably say. Um, that there are, there's going to be a time that pharmacy can ting information to a central location. Right now all we're doing is sending it to the switch, which goes to the insurance company and comes back. So there's no way to really know what another pharmacy filled at this time. That's why you have to have the list and you have to communicate. That I'll get into a little bit more of that. But I, I still advocate, um, you know, sometimes people do have to use a different pharmacy at discharge. Like Denali Pharmacy is the only one open 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Everybody else closes earlier on the weekends. So, you know, we're there for you. <laughs> um, before you leave the pharmacy counter, I would suggest you look at the vial that you're picking up, 
make sure your name's on it. And then go ahead and open that top and look at those tablets inside. Because I say this because we're human. Our pharmacy staff, we're human. Things happen, unexplainable things sometimes happen. And we just wanna make sure you, we got your med and you got your right medication. And even though the pharmacy knows we put the right medication in the bottle, sometimes it can look significantly different. If you look at lisinopril up at the top, it can be a little round yellow tablet with an M. It can be a white tablet. It can be a peach oblong tablet, or it can be a pink round tablet. And these are all different manufacturers of lisinopril. And depending on the marketplace, meaning depending what's going on with these manufacturers, it may be this is the only one available this month, and next month this is the only one available. It also can have to do with your pharmacy and their contracting with the wholesaler and how, what we get in for the day. So our lisinopril actually has changed like that before. And we try to put little stickers, hey, this is the same med but looks significant different, and we try to alert you but sometimes we miss that. So I always say double check. The bottom part is Lipitor. The nice thing about the, all the Lipitor generics, they're all white, they're just not the same shape. <laughs> so my biggest thing is, if it doesn't look right, question it. Call the pharmacy, even when you get home and say, here's my old bottle, here's my new bottle, they don't look alike, can you double check it? I, they, and I have people apologize, sorry I'm calling you about this, but. I'd rather you call me 10 times a day on a question like that and make sure you have the right medication. So what else can you do and I, um, to help manage your medications and your loved ones? The biggest thing is a list of medications, a current list of your medications. That is the biggest thing you can do to help yourself in case you ever get admitted. And later on when I talk about traveling with your meds, that's critical. You can have a pharmacy generate your list, especially if you use one. And you know pharmacy systems can also add your supplements. So whatever you're not filling at the pharmacy, the pharmacist can add that into your profile and be screening against it. And we can also generate um, pharmacy med list um, that would have your whole complete list of meds you take. You can also get one from your providers you can develop your own list. And I had a lot of fun a couple of weekends, weekends ago and I lost a lot of time when I went on the iTunes app and started looking at what's available for your iPhone. There are applications for your iPhone that will manage your meds, will remind you to take your meds, will send emails to your provider. <laughs> There's all kinds of things that can happen with apps. So I'm not up on what's the best, but I know they're all out there. So these are just a couple examples of medication lists. And when you do it, you should have the name of the med, the dose, know what time of day you always take it or how many times a day you take it, know if you take it with or without food, know what the medication is for, um, the date you started it, maybe the do date you stop it, or maybe the date you're intending to stop it, the doctor who prescribed it, and maybe just a list of side effects to be aware of. This is one generic list. Um, this is one actually, if you were to get all your meds filled at say Denali Pharmacy or another pharmacy and we put in your supplements, we can actually do another list and it actually show you what, what the tablet looks like and has the same information. This uh, form, and I actually made a whole bunch of them and put them in the back because I really like this. Because this is not only a medication list, it's almost like a med medication administration record. This, is, this what, is what I made for my dad. It was a combination of things. Um, so it has the name, it has the height, has a date that you started that sheet, list the allergies, name of the um, doctor name, doctor phone number, pharmacy name, pharmacy phone number, but also lets you record daily weights. So congestive heart failure patients, that's critical to keep track of weight. Diabetic patients, there's your blood sugar, place to record your blood pressure. Um, exercise, 
here's my plug about exercise. It's critical. You got to keep moving. Whether you do 20 minutes a day or not, it's a really good thing. And doctors want to know what you're, how you're moving. So I always say it's always good to say, maybe put a little blurb, how you moved that day. And then the next thing starts listing the meds. And the way these uh, chart works out, there's four slots next to each med for each day. You can just write when you took it, so you know when you took it, so you have a record. So if something were to happen, like my dad and the ambulance gets called, then this gets whipped out and the ambulance people can see when they last had medications. I always advocate too, if you're on any kind of pain medication or chronic pain medication or taking pain meds as needed, that you keep track of something like this because it's a good record to show to your doctor exactly how you use your medication, how often you're taking it. <clears throat> um, Adherence packaging. Uh, there's a couple, I should have brought actually physical medi sets, but the, the far upper corner one with the, the purple and the green, that's a medi set or a pill box. There's another four place one that's a slider opening. Those are used, those are pretty much self um, patient fills those and keeps track of them. But here you have in the right hand corner, lower, lower corner is a bubble pack. And uh, I believe Alaska Family Pharmacy Prescription Center provides the service right now. They can bubble pack meds. And it just has morning, midday, evening, and nighttime slots. And, and across is the days. And it just let, helps you keep track of your medications. Um, my dream one would be this one that says lunch here. Someday I want a machine that does this where I can sit there and I can fill all your meds and it would give you pockets of your medications for morning, noon, and evening. That's probably the best adherence packaging I've seen. It gives you a list of what the drugs are on them and what they look like in the packaging. Someday I'll have one of those, maybe. Um, the other one is a pill timer box, which is helpful when you only want people to have a med at a certain time of day. Besides those adherence packages, routines help you remember to take your pills. This is my routine, the morning routine. I'm on levothyroxine, you gotta take it before you have your coffee. So my routine is I wake up and I go get my coffee maker going and I take my levothyroxine and I jump through the shower and my prize is my cup of coffee. In the evening, I do my evening routine, I take my evening med, and I literally dive into bed just like that. And last night, I was super tired and maybe a little worried about things, and I did my evening routine and I dove into bed, and as soon as I hit the bed, I go, I forgot to take my pill. So little things like that will help you remember, besides the adherence packaging, besides setting timers. Um, the other kind of uh, difficulties that I've heard about is dexterity problems, especially with eye meds. Um, those little tiny bottles they send home with those droppers, and you've got to hit your eye, and when you have a tremor, it can be very, very difficult. And there's some aids that can help with that. There's one that just the bottle sets in and, and it helps you align with your eye. But the other thing was gripping. I had a, a lady that told me she couldn't grip. And when she finally did get a good grip, then she squirted it all out. So there are these little, I don't even know what you call them, grip mechanisms <laughs> that you can get. And I actually am looking to bring those in because I think it would be a good thing to help. And then in combination with the alignment thing would be a real helpful thing uh, to make sure the drops hit your eye. Dexterity. Opening t bottles, easy open bottles. Talk to your pharmacist about asking about that. You don't have to have the safety caps. You just have to sign that you're okay having non-safety caps in your home and that you're gonna keep them safe and away from people. There are medi sets down at the bottom here that are push button. Problem is that I've heard with those is if you drop them and they hit the floor just right, they all pop open. So. There's always a downside to everything, and I like to tell you both sides so you know what's going on. 
um, hard to see in people who are blind. This to me was really interesting because I, uh, I don't have any patients this is an issue for, but there are pharmacies that can prevent or that can print braille labels. I actually saw it at a conference one time. Um, there are also smart vials, like the one that sits on the round thing is the, the, the vials are programmed that when they sit on there, they talk. You can also put audible labels, that's the far left one. I think it's like what you have, those messengers in your car where you can leave this quick message. And I think you just adhere it to the vial. And this is an audible reader label maker that I saw on Amazon for $80. It'll convert things to um, an audible label. So it's kind of interesting. Um, but sometimes you don't have the tools. And sometimes it's very confusing, especially the eye medications and their little tiny print. And when you take them out of the vial, which one is which? And so my recommendation, and I think Margaret shared this with me, Margaret, um, my mentor, um, is that you, get, you can get little labels and just label your medications A, B, and C, put the, the label on the actual bottle, ophthalmic bottle, the medication bottle, and then just old school with Sharpie marker for the person so they know and you can line it up. Isn't that how you did it, Margaret? You can have a check mark next to it daily so you know how you're keeping track of the eye meds. I thought that was a neat idea. See, it takes talking. Sometimes we come up with great ideas to help you out. Um, cognitive impairment. Um, is really a tough one with medications. I had a family friend whose dad really needed to be in an assisted living home. He couldn't manage his meds. He almost caught the kitchen on fire kind of thing, but they couldn't get him in anywhere. So he, he came to live with my friend and her husband. The biggest challenge was medication because unfortunately they couldn't be with them all the time. I mean, they set up things, neighbors would check on them every two hours, somebody would come home from lunch, he went to senior care during the day, but sometimes he just had to be left alone for a few hours. And so they got a med locking box so that the daytime dose would pop open and hopefully the timer would remind him that he needed to take it, unfortunately. Um, sometimes the timer wasn't enough. It would pop open and it'd still be open when her, my friend got home. Um, I think the biggest thing I say is that most medications for those people need to be put away and locked away and so they're not easily accessible except for the one dose they need. And I'm going to include even topical drugs on there because something my friend never thought about was the topical hydrocortisone ointment that her father thought was an eye medication. And there was a close call with that. And so really, you would hope that you would have a full-time caregiver, or they'd be in a setting that they would be well taken care of. But if you can't, there's these adherence packaging, like I still, I'm sold on the little lunch packets where you put all your, you know, the meds and you can separate it out. The downside I read about these little timer boxes when I researched it for my friend is, guess what? <laughs> they took their pill and then they think that it's time for another pill and it's not opening. So something must be wrong with the box. The patient thinks something's wrong with the box. Guess what? They're still good with a screwdriver. So they take the battery out. It unlocks the whole thing. So these are the kind of stories you just can't imagine, but they do happen with medications in the home. So when I was talking to my mom and I said I was doing this talk and I was kind of nervous about it and I didn't know exactly what all I was going to talk about, she said, don't, re don't forget the three ring binder. This was the biggest thing that my dad used to take control of his medications, to have um, a good list that he always knew what was going on. Um, uh, he when he passed away, he had three full big binders 
of his daily medications, when he took it, how he took it, those, this, the seven-day medication administration record, he could, took track of it. He knew his weight. He knew how to adjust his diuretics um, on certain days when his weight went up. He knew he would take it to his doctor's visits. His doctors would sit down and proudly go over his blood sugars and see what meds he was taking. Um, his doctor actually also, he would prescribe something and my dad goes, no, I'm pretty sure I've had that before. <laughs> or he, the doctor says, I think I'm gonna try this drug. Why don't you call your pharmacist's daughter and see if that's okay? <laughs> so this was really a really big tool. And, and I say this even for when you get admitted to the hospital, it's good to have a notebook to write down for everybody that walks in the room. What doctor just came and saw you? What was that name? Um, my mother-in-law was pretty sick there and um, I'm the only healthcare worker in the family, so they said, why don't you call, your, you know, my husband says, call my, my dad and find out what's going on. So I called my father-in-law, what's going on? Well, I don't know, there was this doctor that walked in the room, and it's this, this generality. He couldn't recall anybody's name, couldn't remember what specialty they were, and I said, oh, you really need to get a notebook. And he goes, yeah, yeah. Well, he didn't write it down, so he didn't do it. Soon my sister-in-law showed up and I said, you gotta get a, uh, a notebook. And so they did, and it did make a big difference. You feel a little more in control when you know what's going on. I mean, I'm guilty of this. I had a question I wanted to ask my doctor. I thought, oh, I'll remember it. <laughs> no, I didn't. I had to call or email her later, write it down, get a big, sticky note and stick it in your notebook when you have questions so you're prepared to talk to the doctor. These are just some lists I found that are helpful and I would say to print it out and put it in that book, notebook so you know what to ask, what to talk to your doctor when he prescribes the medication. You know, besides the name, besides how and when to take it, how long do you expect me to be on it? Are there certain tests I need to do while I'm on this medication? What should I watch out for? Um, when will this medicine begin to work? Will I even know this medicine is gonna work? So there's this, these list of questions. This other one I really like is, do I need refills? Just today, I had a VA patient and he was discharging with a blood thinner and I said, I'm a little concerned. Um, um, you have this medication, but you have no refills. The doctor didn't write any refills on discharge. Do you know what to do about this medication um, to get more meds? Because it's just not a one-time fill. <laughs> this is something that usually goes on for a couple days. Do you have a follow-up appointment? Are you being seen? Make sure you don't run out of this medication. These are all kind of critical points to keep in mind. I'm gonna have to talk a little faster because I gave too much information in here. I had too broad of a topic, I think. Um, is it safe to drink alcohol while on this medication? Well, maybe. <laughs> um, there are some things to think about. There are certain medications that can interact with alcohol. And unfortunately, you know, our aging bodies, we don't clear alcohol as well. And we also clear medication slowly. So guess what? people become more sensitive to either one. It also can have additive effects. So if you have a medication that's already causing drowsiness or dizziness, sleepiness, taking alcohol with it can make it worse. Um, the biggest thing is you need to talk to your health profession, professional on each case. So that's my plug about that. That's the other more common question at the pharmacy. So just real quickly, a couple of things about traveling with your medication. Whether you're going to that awesome tropical setting or just down the, the road to go fishing, the number one thing you need to do is make sure you have your medications and that you have enough doses with you. The other major thing is you should always take your list of medications with you. So you all take this home, fill this out and keep it with you. So the must haves for travel, the current list of medications prescribed by your physician, you should have your provider's name and phone number. You should have your pharmacy's name and phone number. 
You should have a current list of your allergies and their reactions. And I'm going to just sidebar allergies and reactions. So sometimes people list drugs as an allergy, and it's actually just the sensitivity. And so I always want to know how you reacted to a medication, because we don't want to discount a whole class of drugs that may be able to help you someday. So we get all kinds of things. I'm allergic to penicillin. What's your reaction? I don't know. My mom reacted to it. <laughs> Wait, your mom reacted to it? Yeah. Well, that doesn't mean you're necessarily reacted to it. <laughs> Please make sure you know what your reactions are to it. I had a gentleman who had four pages, front and back, list of medications and what he had reacted to. They weren't real clear. There were more sensitivities, but he handed me those papers and said, these are my allergies. It was a little difficult because the drug the physician had just prescribed was listed, its near cousin was listed on this list. So I was asking the gentleman, what was your reaction? Oh, I don't recall. And I'm like, so I called the provider. Do you have any more details? No, but we talked about it. So having a good description of your reaction to your allergies is a really good thing to have. And it's good to have it on you in case something happens so you have a clear list to give us when you're on tour. Because Denali Pharmacy is the pharmacy that's open every day of the year, 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. Guess what happens in the summertime? Tourists. Guess what happens first thing I have happen every week at my pharmacy counter as a tourist showing up? Because, one, they ran out of meds, two, they forgot to bring their meds, or three, they got sick and they need meds. So this is all kind of helpful. <clears throat> the one example I have is this. A, a gentleman got off the plane at 9, 9 o'clock at night. He was at my counter at 9.30 on a Sunday. And guess what? His insulin pump was run, running empty. He had forgotten to grab the insulin before he left his house and put it in his carry-on the last second. He was out of insulin. He didn't really need to be admitted to the hospital, he just needed more insulin. So then we played the 20 questions games. Do you know what kind of insulin that is? Because some insulins are over the counter and I could just sell it to you and it would be awesome. But guess what? It wasn't that type of insulin. It was another one, but he couldn't remember if it was Novolog or Humalog. And I, could, I wasn't going to take that 50-50 chance. And I said, so what pharmacy do you fill at? Well, I don't know. It's one of those chain stores. <laughs> Does it start with a C or a W? <laughs> let's, let's try this out. Some of those are 24-hour pharmacies. Maybe I can call one of them, get it. Turned out it was started with a W, and I Googled the closest Walgreens that was open 24 hours. They sometimes can get into and see other patients' meds from other pharmacies. He was able to tell me what type of insulin. Then the next chore was to get him a script. So, and the last part of that story was his prescription insurance <laughs> didn't work. But we did end up getting him his insulin and he get, did get on the road. Um, the one sad story I have about traveling with meds is my mom. The worst call I got from my brother ever. They were, I knew my brother and my mom had just met up. It was right before Christmas in Florida. They're planning to stay in Florida for like three days, go to Key West, and then fly to Mexico. And they had my college age and nieces and nephews just got there. They had rented an SUV, all met up, threw the luggage in the back of the SUV, started to go to Key West, pulled over at a Cracker Barrel to have lunch. They walked in, and somebody popped the back of their trunk, stole everything out of that car. And fortunately, my mom carries this big carry-on with her, and she had her medicine in there. So at least she had seven days' worth of drugs, but they were going to be gone for three weeks. So my brother was more concerned about my mom's meds than he was worried about the missing passports that were also in that car. So we were able to recover it because we knew where mom got her meds. She used one pharmacy, got transferred to another pharmacy there quickly, and got refilled quickly. So have a current list. Know your pharmacy.
These are all helpful. I've even had providers call in from Mississippi to say, hey, I got a tourist heading there. They're in Denali Park, but they're out of meds. So even just having your provider's number is helpful. TSA rules. You can travel up to a 90-day supply with your meds. They will also let you take liquids on over the 3.4 ounces. And you can take gel packs to keep your things refrigerated. But it's a good idea to tell them all about that before you go through security. Pull them out, let them see it before you even go through the x-ray part. Um, and I've read recently having a list because just like they're getting picky about the food, they're getting picky about meds. So if you had a list of medications of what you're supposed to take from your provider, it might make screening go a little faster. The question is, do you check it or do you carry it on? If at all possible, carry it on. You know how many stories I hear about, oh, I put it in my suitcase and when I got there, it wasn't there? It's happened. It's happened when people have flown to Alaska. Those are the calls I make to get transfer prescriptions or new ones. So if all possible, carry it on. If you can't carry all your medications on, put seven days worth in your carry-on, put the rest in the suitcase. But what will you carry with you? A current list of your medications, always. So um, what's also helpful, I think, on medication management in itself is to make sure that you refill in a timely fashion, maybe a week early all the time. So at least you're kind of a week early of your medications. That helps you when you travel. It also helps when your meds are synced up and they're all filled at the same time because nothing is more frustrating than to get two of your meds, but this one is too soon and you can't get it until two days after you leave. Um, but the other thing is check with your prescription insurance what you can do about vacation overrides. Historically, pharmacies, Margaret will remember this, you just call up patients going on vacation, can we get an early fill? It was usually no problem. Now it's a problem because they don't want to hear us say it. They want you to call and they want you to say where you're going and for how long and what's your destination because they think that if you're going somewhere else where there's a pharmacy, you can just transfer it when you get there. So they're not letting early refills go as much as they used to. So longer vacations, the snowbirders, the full-time RVers, people that live here for six months and live down in the States for six months, your providers here or your providers there. Um, it's always good to talk to your pharmacist and provider the best way to help with these situations. Um, you can use a pharmacy that mails out, that might be able to mail out to where you go for half the year. Um, the other thing, my parents were full-time RVers for 10 years when they left Alaska in 1990. <clears throat> and this is before internet and cell phones. So they used a mail order pharmacy because they kept their meds synced and they send it to my brother's house. My brothers would hold on to it until they got the destination where they could meet up with their meds and mail it out to them. Um, the other thing you can do is get talk to your provider. Maybe you can get a six month prescription for your home base and six months for where your snowbird destination is. You can also have tra prescriptions transferred from one pharmacy to the other. Unfortunately, when you transfer a prescription from one pharmacy to the other, it now resides at the other pharmacy. So if you're going to Washington and you, we transfer your script to Washington, when you come back to Fairbanks, it's still in Washington and we have to transfer it back. It has to occur between pharmacist to pharmacist. So if you go to another state and you need to have a prescription transferred, find a pharmacy you want to use. Tell them your pharmacy, your prescription's at this pharmacy and could you call there and get it? and they'll do it. The only exceptions are like controlled substances um, can't be transferred if they've never been filled. So like if they're just on hold. I had this case where a gentleman had his, his um, medication renewed and sent to his regular pharmacy. Then he asked me to transfer it and I couldn't do it by law because it had never been filled there. It was just sitting on hold waiting to be filled. And the other thing is some states like New York only allow one transfer in. So even though you have this prescription with 11 refills, we transfer it to New York, they only fill it once, deactivates my script, 
and then you only get one fill off of it. So these are the things that can happen, and that's why I say you really need to talk to your pharmacy. This is, I threw this in for fun. My, this is my uncle. Um, my aunt and uncle live near the border, and they love to go to the pharmacy across the border. This is their pharmacy. Serves margaritas, plays a mariachi band, and it has I love Viagra posters in the background. Um, do I advocate running for the border for meds? Depends on the meds, really. Um, my, my parents were full-time RVers. My dad used to get his inhalers there. They were in the exact same packaging, only had Spanish on it, same manufacturers. I think you can get medications that way, but you have to be very cautious about it. And I think they just go for the margaritas. I have pictures of them dancing, but I couldn't do that. My aunt would kill me. But they, they text these to me all the time. I'm visiting my pharmacy, and I'm, I always think I should present this to, to the powers that be at my work and say. Yes. My dad did too. He, at one time, he, I don't know if my brother misunderstood him, but my dad, my brother's like, I'm not going with you. <laughs> but um, I, someday I'm going to go visit them so I can have a margarita there. Uh, traveling to foreign countries, medications must be in their original packaging. You can only take a supply only personally for you. So don't take 12 bottles of something just because you think you might need it. They won't let you through. You need to have a doctor's list of medications, current list of medications. See this reoccurring th theme I have going through here? And the one um, idea is to have it translated into um, the, the language of the destination of your country. I think that's a really good idea because you know if you get hurt or get sick, that's where it's really going to help you out. Um, if you're going to certain countries, you really need to check with the embassies what medications can be brought in, what cannot. I've heard some things about, I don't know if it's Japan or China, you can't take in um, the attention deficit disorder stimulants, um, the ADD drugs. They don't like to see those come into the country for some reason. So real quick, because I'm, I'm approaching my time limit. I had way too much stuff to cover. National Drug Take Back Day. Put this in your phone, on your calendar, mark it now. This is the best time to clean out your drug cabinet. Take anything you want out of it, put it in a box, in a bag, and take it to the location. They'll probably advertise the locations just about a couple weeks before you do it. The great thing about National Take Back Day is that they take anything back. I had a lady pass away, and her family came up to clean out their apartment. Three moving boxes of meds. I'm not talking about little tiny moving boxes. I'm talking about the ones that stood waist high. They were only up here to clean out of her apartment and have the funeral, and they were leaving. They wanted me to take her meds. Fortunately, National Drug Take Back Day was that Saturday, so I took it out of the kindness of my heart, stored it, and took it to National Take Back Day, and tripled what the troopers collected at that site. <laughs> um, they have collected a lot of drugs on these National Take Back Days. They've had 15 as of April, but the information they have as of uh, the October 28, 2017, they had collected um, a total of almost four, four and a half tons of medications from all these take back days. I think it, it is a tremendous service that they do and have started. But, um, and the great thing, like I say, they'll take back any amount. It's supported by local law enforcement. And they usually generally have about four locations here in town when they do it. So med safes, this is what you can find at Denali Pharmacy. You can take prescription drugs and drop them in there. You can put controlled substance over the counter, vitamins, medicated lotions, creams, ointments, liquids, less than four ounces, transdermal patches. What you're really not supposed to put in there is any needles, sharps, um, chemo drugs, hazardous drugs. They don't want aerosols in there. And I'm supposed to not know about illicit drugs going there, but 
people don't monitor what goes in there. <laughs> it's just not a trash can. That drives me nuts because it looks like a trash can receptacle. So not only does Denali Pharmacy has it, but Fairbanks Police Department has one on Cushman Street. Bassett has one, the Army Hospital, North Pole Police, Alaska Family Pharmacy at North Pole, and the medical group at Ileson. If you were to dispose of medications at home, you take them out of the original packaging, mix it with something undesirable, put it in a sealable package like a Ziploc bag, throw that in the garbage, take your personal information on the prescription vial, scratch it out, throw it away separately just to protect your privacy. Or, thanks to the public nurse back supplying these, you can get these charcoal bags. Um, if you get the little one, you can put up to 15 pills or two ounces of liquids or two patches in it. The bigger one, you can put 45 pills or six ounces of liquid or six patches. Or you can mix it with un something undesirable. That's what I did when my dad passed away. They didn't have any take back stuff. I took a milk jug, put it in there, mixed it with some coffee grounds, some rotten food, a little bit of yucky stuff, some dirt, sealed it up tight and threw it away. Aerosols are still a problem um, and waste management would probably take that. Fentanyl patches or patches with any drug um, any drug patches, even though you remove them, they still have a certain amount of drug in it. And fentanyl patches, they have a dangerous amount of drug in it. It is the only thing that the DEA or FDA says it's okay to flush. Um, but you can also put it in one of these or bring it to my med safe. Um, but um, that's the only one they advocate flushing. Oral chemo drugs. This is a difficult one, because really they should be disposed of properly. Um, I would say if you're getting it dispensed from the cancer treatment center here in town, it probably should go back to them so they can dispose of it properly. So I'm five minutes over, and I have just a couple of bonus things to tell you. Are you guys up for it? Yeah. Go for it? OK. So here's. Um, this is courtesy of National Chain Store Pharmacies. They gave me, I found these slides, they're awesome. This first one shows you what happens when a prescription enters the pharmacy and how smoothly it can be filled when there's no issues. And I'll just tell you that pharmacists rely on pharmacy technicians to help us with this pro process. Pharmacy technicians are fabulous people. They have been well trained in the pharmacy to aid the pharmacist. They can talk to you about everything but the drug, drug therapy, drug side effects. They can't talk to you about that. That's the pharmacist has to talk to you. But a pharmacy technician actually know more about the, your insurance than I do. <laughs> they are really good. And so it, it drives a pharmacy technician nuts if you call and say, can I talk to the pharmacist? And then I pick up the phone, you ask me an insurance question because they go, oh, I could have done that. So utilize our pharmacy technicians. They're wonderful people. But what happens is a prescription can be received into the pharmacy by fax, by e-prescribe, by verbal, by hard copy. You're in the system and gets filled, gets typed, inputted by the pharmacy technician, gets adjudicated to the insurance company, comes back with a paid claim. Pharmacy has the drug in stock gets filled in the bottle, gets labeled, gets handed to the pharmacist, pharmacist verifies it, dose is good, right person, everything looks good, it all matches up, no drug interactions, and then we go counsel you. Maybe 10, 15 minute process if the stars align. If the stars do not align, this is what it can look like. It can be awful. Number one is pharmacy doesn't get your prescription because e-prescribed is not instantaneous. It also takes the provider to hit the button on the other end, which sometimes doesn't happen. So I've had people leave first care on, what is it? What street are they on? Noble. Drive over to the hospital and I have not seen their e-prescribed yet. Because it has to get out of the firewall at TVC, go down to I think it's San Antonio where the switches with sure scripts come bouncing back through our firewall at the hospital and get into my pharmacy and match up to your name. So I'd like to say 
I, I think the doctor thinks it's like the Jetsons. Here, I push the button. Now go pick up your, pharm your prescription at the pharmacy. It comes out generated on the other end. It doesn't. It still has to go through that other process of being, that you saw on the other screen. <clears throat> so not having the prescription is a problem, or not having refills, not having you in the system with all our current information, that can hold it up. Um, oh, guess what? The doctor forgot to write the quantity on it, or didn't complete the directions, or there's a drug interaction, duplicate therapy, anything that can cause a pharmacist to call the doctor. Um, okay, now we got all the information, we send it off to the insurance company. Guess what? It's not on formulary with your insurance company. It's not the drug they'll pay for. It's too soon. It needs a prior authorization, which is code word your doctor has to submit more information to the insurance company so they know it's okay to pay for it. That can take days. Um, okay, all that aligns, it gets paid. Guess what? Don't have the drug on the shelf. Nationwide shortage. Mark, he's an inpatient pharmacy, can attest to that. We have a lot of shortages now. <clears throat> and then we finally get it done and we check it. So what was a what five-step process on the other screen is now a nine-step process. So have patient with us, patience with us. It's not an easy thing. Pharmacy is not a magical thing. It's not a drive-through. The script doesn't come in here and come out here just as easily as can be. The big question, actually I've been asked to come talk to other organizations about affordability. This could be a talk in itself, so I will condense it in two minutes. <clears throat> if for some reason your medication comes out with a really high copay or you just can't afford it, ask the pharmacy staff for a more affordable option. I always hear, do you have a cheaper drug? That's the wrong terminology. The cheaper drug can be just as good as the high-end drug. It's just you want a more affordable option. You also, um, and this is a tricky thing, because do I go political or not? Okay, do I? Okay, so pharmacists are not allowed to tell you that we can sell a drug cheaper cash than what your copay is. I just got recorded saying that. I know, you're gonna be in trouble. Yeah. But, but the governor needs to sign that. Yep. Right. So if your script comes back for a $10 copay and I know I can sell it for $7 to you, my cash price, I can't tell you. I'm not allowed to tell you. The third party plans, insurance plans, have a gag rule on pharmacists. We cannot tell you. But you can ask, wow, that copay seems kind of high. You sure the cash price isn't cheaper? That should be your tagline from now on. Because if you ask me that, I can tell you I can't offer it. So that's, that there is, a, there is a bill that was passed unanimously by the House and the Senate, and we're waiting for the governor to sign it. Once he signs it, I can talk to you all day long about prices without fear of retaliation. But right now, I can't. Um, to, it, it's... Alaska passed regulation to say it's okay for pharmacists. Actually, Trump brought this up, and he said it was a problem too at the federal level, and they were trying to get a federal thing going, but I think it's stalled out. But state by state, they're taking this on because the insurance companies are not totally transparent with their pricing. So, <laughs> was that a nice way to say it? Yeah. <laughs> um, Check with your insurance company. Call the number on the back of the card. Ask them what is covered by their insurance. What is a, a drug that's similar to this one that they would pay for? Um, manufacture copay cards. They help with branded drugs. They knock down the copay. Unfortunately, there's exclusions with it. They won't knock down the copay for Medicare Part D or for Medicaid patients. So there are some issues with that. Manufacturer cards are very different from discount cards. You see the advertisement all the time for discount cards? Bring down your drug pricing? If you have a prescription plan, you're probably getting the best price you can possibly do. Those discount cards, all they do is knock down the pharmacy's cash price and then charge a pharmacy a fee to do that. <laughs> 
So some pharmacies don't accept those discount cards. Assistance program. This is a really, really nice website. I don't know if you can read it, but it's on my sheet in the back. Needymeds.org. If you're ever having a hard time talk, finding uh, um, a way to afford meds, this site will do it. Just type in the name, and it'll come up with not only copay cards, manufacturer assistance, but it'll also come up with like Cystic Fibrosis Association will help pay for certain drugs. Certain um, disease states have associations that help with co-pays, so you're not alone. So I use that program all day long. Local associations or charitable organizations will help. Love Inc. has helped patients pay for co-pays. Salvation Army has done it. Um, Interior AIDS Association will help with HIV and AIDS-related drugs. Um, Interior Cancer Association has paid for some co-pays. And the last one, if you're on Medicare and you're having a hard time with payment of your drugs, Access Alaska has a federally trained person and Medicare. Um, there's a local Medicare office in Anchorage. This is the phone number. You may have to call and leave your name and your telephone, but they will get back to you in two days usually and help you figure out a way to fix your issue. I've had a couple of patients whose Medicare Part D was messed up and it was saying they should be paying this and they couldn't, it, it was, but these people straightened it out. They straightened out a Medicare Part D, Part B as in boy one time. But Access Alaska, they have federally trained people, so they'll help you during the open enrollment period, which is October 15th to December 7th or so. Make sure you always review your current list of meds with your current Medicare provider. Make sure you've got the best fit. And the last one is, I'm not gonna go through all this, but I'm just gonna go to the bottom line here. Talk to your pharmacist. I'm gonna put a plug out to all my fellow pharmacists in town. You've got Cindy, Marshall, and Scott, all at Fred Meyer West on airport. You've got Mary, Caitlin, and Steve, and John at Fred Meyer East. You've got the Alaska Family Pharmacy guys, Leif, Ed, those guys. They do a wonderful job of helping, and I, I have to put a plug in, Denali Pharmacy and my guys, Kelly, Jim, Dick, and, and Lorraine. We've all been here at that pharmacy for 10 years. We care about you guys. We wanna make sure you get your meds, that you understand them, and that you can take them. So any medication issue, feel free to contact your pharmacist and talk to them. That's why we're here. Finish line, made it. I didn't crash, I kept the rubber down on the road. Hopefully you guys learned a few tricks and tips. Don't look at the difference in bling between my daughter and I. <laughs> but uh, I was smiling because I made it and I got a trophy that time. So be happy to answer any questions. Yeah. It looks like for some insurers, they're, out, they're saying that certain kinds of um, things like um, I don't want to say they're injectables, but I can't think of the right name. But anyways, are now, will be paid for at your pharmacy, but not at your doctor? There's some weird kinds of stuff going on? There, there are. Actually, I think I just encountered this. My mom called me on that. Um, certain injections that you were getting administered at your doctor's office, they're not getting paid for it anymore. So they want you to go to your pharmacy, get it filled, pick it up and bring it to the doctor's office? Oh, no. they, I'm assuming that they're expecting that the pharmacist is going to administer it to somebody at the pharmacy. That is on the horizon, pharmacist administering when we administer vaccines. And the big push going forward is a pharmacy service of why can't we administer some of these injectables. Is it happening in Fairbanks? I don't think it is yet. It's, I just went to a conference back east and they were saying they were just starting to see it. So. There's shingles vaccine, vaccine. yeah. So, so vaccines are? Are able to do it at the pharmacy and they can do it without a prescription in the state of Alaska. And that's part of your training to be given shots. I just got certified myself on immunization. It's a, it's a grueling thing where you do 20 hours of CE 
reading, learning about each thing, and then we have eight hours of training. And then we can give it. Yeah. Ten years ago, I was unable to purchase aspirin logos in Switzerland. You needed a prescription for that over-the-counter drug in America. Yeah, you know, every, every foreign country has different rules and regulations, and they will classify things differently. You can actually go across the border in Canada and buy a coating without a prescription. You can get a whole lot of antibiotics across the border in Mexico without a prescription. They might have found that aspirin had a risk to it, and that's why they classify, classified it as a prescription drug there. When you take more than one medication and you kind of accumulate them after certain episodes, trying to get them consolidated so I can go in and have them refilled, you know, like they can be done one at a time or even one month, but all the yeah. medications at a time, seems to be an impossibility because the pharmacists can only fill the prescription as it's written, so if the doctor says we fill, you know, every 90 days or 30 days, and when you start that prescription, you're kind of locked into that. Well, I just had a patient today. It was an older child who's t being taken care of by a parent, and she had asked me, can you sync up his meds? So I looked at the profile today, one is due today, one's due in two weeks, and another one's due in two weeks after that, and they're all 90 days. And so what the insurance companies, because they do want us to sync up your meds, they want us to get them all filled at the same time, they do. So they have instituted some codes we can put in the background, because the other thing is, is if we gave you just a partial supply, they would still charge you the full copay. So pharmacists didn't really want to do that because out of pocket wise, it hurt you, right? Because you would get, because what we do is we partial fill. We'll give you, so I synced up this, this person's meds for August 15th. So I have the one that's due today, one that's due in, two, in a, two weeks at the end of the month, and then this third one that's due the middle of August. So what I did was I filled the one today to get them to this one. I filled the one, I, I will fill the one at the end of the month to get them to this. And then on August 14th, I'm gonna fill all three of them for a 90 day. And if I don't have a prescription that has that number of pills left, I will call the doctor and ask him. And we're gonna start training the doctors that we need to sync up people's meds. So if a dose gets changed, what happens? Something happens, you get a new blood pressure med mid-cycle, then we've gotta sync them up. We're fortunate, Denali Pharmacy now has a pharmacy program that helps us. If we sign you up for med syncing, it has a little flag, it's awesome, I saw it today. And if I say, this person fills August 14, pops up and says, hey, you have to give them X amount of days to get to the 14th. And so it tells me what to fill, so. It's a rough deal because pharmacists are old school. We want to give you the best bang for your buck. But if we put these codes in the background when we transmit it to the insurance company, so when I filled the one today, it just charged for one uh, partial copay, not the full copay. So it, it was nice to know that that worked, that the codes are actually. Because that's distressing too, what you're kind of saying, whether I get uh, 30 pills or 90 pills. In some plans, it's whether you get 15 versus 30. That's the same, it's a month copay. So if a doctor, this drives me nuts, when doctors write 45 day supplies, falls right in the middle, you get charged a two month copay. And it's my, been my mission to 
alert the doctors. <laughs> Don't do that. So, yeah. But yeah, all these are really good questions. What is the robot assumption with the dispensing, the parents, so forth? Oh, the robots, like at Fred Meyer's, mm -hmm. the big chain stores, when they're producing quite a bit of medications, and then they fill these cassettes. It's all barcoded um, to, for safety. So you program that you're putting, say, lisinopril 20 in this cassette, barcode it, barcode the bar the manufacturer bottle, barcode the location so that the computer all knows that. So then when it gets processed, these, some of these systems are really slick. They'll count them, drop them into the thing, and wrap the label around it. So nobody has to touch it until the end, until the pharmacist takes it and verifies it. So yeah, um, the machine I was talking about with those pre-packs, it's only about this big, this tall, quite a bit of money. But you put cartridges of the medications in so they get loaded correctly, and then they just get um, unit dosed into these packaging according to the programming. Pretty slick. Mm -hmm. So someday. I'll let you all know when I get that, because I'll be advertising it. <laughs> Any more questions? So I have the, oh. Be on the green side of things, I noticed when the prescriptions say like a 10 day supply, it comes in a bottle of the you know, letter, a supply, serves So size of the prescription label of the pharmacy. I would love to get smaller vials, but my prescription to get all the information on there that I need to, that you could read, because I can shrink down the print size, but you guys wouldn't be able to read it, and I wouldn't either. And then it has to go around, and by law, we have to put those auxiliary labels on there. And so, <laughs> as it is right now, we're getting pretty creative, not covering up what's on the label to get all the auxiliary labels on there. We'll put them on the la lid. In line with that, I, I heard recently of a case where, um, because one of the needs to turn to script that everything's off and you have to throw them away. Yeah. And so I heard recently of a case where they were able to almost butterfly the label on, mm -hmm. so that the edges stuck to the bottle, so the middle idea. part stuck to itself, and it could wrap around, so then you could pull it up, and then you'd have plenty of them to put it on. It would. <laughs> and we do sometimes flag labels. You know, those labels are thermal. I was just thinking of this. I wonder if you could spray alcohol on them and just obliterate everything that's printed on there. Because I know when I touch it with my alcohol hands, I leave black marks on them. Uh, it depends on which ink is used. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have ink that the alcohol will form the medical Yeah. So I guess um, flagging it would be a good thing. You know, sometimes we worry about it sticking, like, the little eye meds, sometimes we'll flag meds to things. In line with the green, oh, sorry. That's, That's right. right. Being green, uh, I can't take my empties back to the pharmacy when I want them refilled. They have to give me, you know. You know, when I was first a pharmacist in, in Oregon, they allowed that. Um, and so we would take your currently labeled bottle and put the same drug in it. Mm -hmm. And then they enacted legislation and said, no, bad practices. Because we don't know how you're going to store the bottle. We don't know what that bottle's been in contact. So when we dispense a medication, we're dispensing it um, and we put an expiration on it. We hope that the bottle is in good shape and that it's stored at room temperature like it's supposed to. And so if a bottle is been dirty, it can be contaminated. There are times people hand us bottles and stuff for refills, and we're like, where has this been? <laughs> yeah. So, any, oh. Could you address the medication, I call it medication creep, and you were talking about like the statistics, how many people uh, have five or more medications, but you know, I've seen a lot of people, like some family members too, it just creeps up there getting more and more different things. and then it's sort of like all of a sudden sometimes for a medical reason sometimes somebody catches it and says have you had a review of these yeah. things i i'm trying to push a little more so pharmacists can't bill for their time we're not provider status 
So we can never bill for our time to sit down with you. So we have to have collaborative agreements with physicians. And right now, that's kind of my goal, my secret goal. Um, I'm trying to talk to TVC, and today that's why I was talking to Porter Heart Center. What would it take? What can we do? Can we have these things? But you know, honestly, I sit down with my patients. If, if I'll schedule a time, and we'll go find a quiet place and go through the meds. There's nothing wrong with you, even in a busy pharmacy, if you plunk down your, your bag of meds and say, can you help me figure this out? We will tr sure try, and if not, get back to you. Because it is really important to have those med reviews, and we're realizing it more and more. Um, but I did try 10 years ago to have a brown bag session to celebrate Pharmacy Week. I advertised it. It's the worst snowstorm ever on an October day, and nobody, hardly anybody came in to work that day. So uh, maybe Margaret, retired pharmacist, you want to do that? Promote farm. Yeah, National Pharmacy Week month is in October. Maybe we'll do something like that. I think one of the, the things that you need to say with this is that people aren't just taking their, their drugs that they prescribe. They're also taking supplements and vitamins and all of these herbs and all and of these And that has to be on the list. And you can all interact. And so you really have to talk to your pharmacist about all of the stuff you're taking, not just your prescription. It does, and because I, I had this, I was counseling on the person's third blood pressure medication. Am I okay to continue? Okay. Um, so this person was picking up their third blood pressure medication. It raised my concern, because so I went up to counsel her, and I said, wow, this is your third one. I didn't say, wow, that makes people to sound terrible. I said, well, uh, looks like we've got another blood pressure medication. Are they taking any of them away? No, they can't get my blood pressure under control. So then we started to have a conversation. And I said, are you, um, by chance, taking anything over the counter? Um, ibuprofen, Aleve, any of those? Yes, I have horrible back pain. And I've really been ramping up my ibuprofen. Well, here's a drug interaction ibuprofen inter can interact with the control of blood pressure. Um, my mother-in-law had five blood pressure medications. They were trying to get it under control so she could have surgery for the horrible shoulder she had that she was taking so much. Uh, it was actually Vioxx at the time, but just now off the market. <laughs> but yeah, her blood pressure, once they took the Vioxx off, suddenly became controlled. It's those kind of examples that these are the conversations you've got to have. It you don't know where the issue may be coming from, and so. And the docs don't always know or don't seem to. I I love the doctors, but you know they have 15 minutes. They got a chart. They got to do a whole bunch of stuff, and so that's why you guys all need to advocate that pharmacists need provider status. That's my other political plug. Other states are granting pro provider status to pharmacists. That way, I can sit down with you and bill for my time. Right now, how I get paid is just reimbursement of the drug. It's not very good right now. So I think we have worth, pharmacists have worth, and we're a critical part of the healthcare team. We, we're on this giant step of change, I can feel it. I'm, I'm really gonna push hard that pharmacists can do something other than count pills, that we can actually have the time to talk to you. I love talking to you. This is what makes the difference. I mean, my dad, I, I love him. I had a, a silent talk with him as I came in. I'm gonna use you as an example tonight, don't get mad. <laughs> um, but uh, honestly, that med rec form that he used, once he had that, that was a powerful tool. He stopped playing games. He started taking everything for real. Okay, he still ate cookies for breakfast, but he took it, checked his blood sugar. He, he exercised. He used his inhalers correctly. He did so, he managed those diuretics to a T. And I, I just say, it's the biggest thing is to tell the patient how, why, you're taking this medication. Why is it important to take it certain ways? And then have them own it. Own your list. Take it to the doctor's office. Make them pay attention to it. 
say, I've been taking it just like you said. Here's my proof. And I'm still having X, Y, and Z. Or I feel better. Or something. This is your own record. Because, you know, five years from now, you can't remember, oh, they might have started me on this, and it did this. And you're relying on the clinic to have that record, which they do, but they don't have time to review. But you know. You guys are your best historians and your best advocates. And so that's my biggest take home. Current list, be your own advocate, ask the questions, harass the pharmacist, it's okay. We're here for that. So, anything else? Thanks for coming out. Thank you.